Hello, everyone. Good afternoon or good morning to you, wherever you are, and thank you for joining us today for BMCC's trade webinar series. We're glad to see that there's a lot of interest in this market as this event is 100% fully subscribed. Today's topic will be the changing face of higher education post-COVID-19 Malaysia. My name is Phoebe. I am a trade manager at the British Malaysian Chamber of Commerce, or BMCC as we are more commonly known. Our distinguished panel of speakers for today are Ms. Fu Ching Yi from QS Kuala Lumpur. Hi, Ching Yi. Hi. Who will be our moderator for today? Ching Yi is the Director of Operations and heads up the QS Kuala Lumpur office with over 100 employees from various QS business units. Many of you will be aware that QS is the world's leading provider of services, analytics, and insights to the global higher education sector. Beyond your publication of the world's market-leading university rankings portfolio, QS also compiled the QS International Student Survey, the world's largest survey of the sentiments and preferences of prospective international students. We will see some of the COVID-19 related insights in today's session. We also have three prestigious universities joining us today. From the University of Nottingham is Professor Dr. Graham Kendall. Hi, Graham. Hi. Prof. Graham is the Provost and CEO of the University of Nottingham, Malaysia. He's also Pro Vice Chancellor of the University and sits on the University's Executive Board. The University of Nottingham Malaysia campus opened in 2000 and was the first ever branch campus of a British university established outside the UK. Earning the distinction of the Queen's Award for Enterprise 2001 and the Queen's Award for Industry International Trade 2006. Apart from Malaysia, Nottingham also has another overseas campus in China. Graham, congratulations on celebrating 20 years in Malaysia. Thank you. Joining us from Asia E University is the founder, president, and CEO, Prof. Dr. Ansari Ahmad. Hello, Prof. Ansari. Hi, Phoebe. Hello, everybody. Asia E University is one of a new breed of global digital universities and a collaborative multinational government-funded university initiated by the Asian Cooperative Dialogue, a body established in 1998 to promote Asian cooperation at a continental level. Asia E University offers on-campus blended and online learning programs with a reach of 35 member countries in Asia. And last but not least, joining us from the University of Malaya is the Vice Chancellor Dato I.R. Dr. Abdul Rahim Haji Hashim. Hello, Dato Rahim. Hi, Phoebe. How is everybody? The University of Malaya is a public research university established in 1949. Apart from being the oldest university in Malaysia, the University of Malaya is also one of the top 60 universities in the world. Dato Rahim, congratulations on your recent milestone achievement in rising in the QS rankings. Thank you. Once again, a huge thank you to all our speakers for joining us today. Before we start the session, a little bit of housekeeping. Please be forthcoming with your questions during the session and send it in through the Q&A function available at the bottom of the screen instead of in the public chat function. We will attempt to address your questions if time permits. Before we begin, I would like to share some information on the BMCC. Many of you will be aware that the BMCC is a bilateral trade organization. Our key pillars are networking and events, branding and exposure, trade services, and industry advocacy. The BMCC is also part of a network of British Chambers of Commerce globally and also in the Southeast Asian region called Bizia or Britain in Southeast Asia. The BMCC is also the overseas delivery partner for the Department for International Trade in the UK. Our services are listed on the slide, which includes B2B matching, market reports, and event management. 
My role within trade services is to assist UK education institutions and organizations in the Malaysian market with a focus on UK exports. Details on our trade publications, webinars, and events are available on our website, bmcc.org.my. And finally, here are our contact details. Please feel free to reach out for any assistance in the market. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Ching Yi to begin the session. Over to you, Ching Yi. Okay, thank you, Phoebe. Let me just share okay. my screen here. Um, hang on. In it. All right. How's everyone doing? Can everybody see my screen? All good? Can I start? Yep. Okay, great. So good morning or good evening, depending on where you're logging in from. Um, so today we will take a look at some of the insights that we have gathered. As you may be well aware, QS has been running a number of surveys as part of our work in the World University Rankings. But we also run the world's largest international student survey. And today I will be sharing some of those insights from two particular surveys that provide some information about the impact of COVID-19. So first off is the survey of prospective international students focusing on how the COVID-19 pandemic has affected uh, students' decisions to study abroad. Secondly, the survey of educational institutions about how the crisis has affected them and how institutions intend to provide normal service as best as possible during this difficult time. So a little bit about the background and methodology. Yeah, uh, the data that we have collected here has been running in a, in a survey since uh, February with periodic invitations being sent out. It comes from over 40,000 responses from prospective students around the world uh, who are considering to study in a range of destination countries such as the US, um, UK, Canada, Australia, Germany, Japan, Singapore, Malaysia and many other countries. About half of the respondents are looking to take up an undergraduate or foundation course. Um, and then about 70% of them have indicated that they are currently in the process of researching for courses or universities, or they have started to fill out an application. In terms of um, the universities that we have surveyed the in, in the institution survey, we've collected responses from about a thousand higher education institutions around the world since March. Um, responses come from universities in the UK, in the US, Australia, Canada, Malaysia, Philippines, and so on. So I'll be able to share a little bit of insight starting with the student responses. So here in the chart, you can see that in the first few weeks of the survey in February and early March, just under 30% have said that their plans have been disrupted by COVID-19. At this time, if, if you recall, uh, we were in a stage where COVID-19 was largely restricted to China and the city of Wuhan and was just starting to spread outside of Wuhan to different parts of the world in Korea and Europe and so on. And as we began to see a more global response to the health crisis, such as border closures, and, and also the WHO declaration of a global pandemic, the number of students who say that their plans are affected steadily increased. So it went from um, you know, 30% uh, early part of the survey to what is closer to 66% today. Towards the end of March in early April, um, we start to see the United States taking over as the center of the epidemic from Europe with global cases surpassing over 700,000 cases. Um, and more countries starting to impose lockdowns in India and in Australia. So we can see that as the pandemic and its implications begin to set in, more students responded saying that the pandemic has affected their plans to study abroad. In a similar pattern, at the, at the start of the pandemic in February, more students would say that they were looking to study in a different country than the one that they had originally planned. If you see the red bar with the 32%, 
But as it became more apparent that the pandemic affected all countries globally, fewer students said that they would choose to study in a different country than the one they had planned. Despite the scale of the pandemic and its impact on the world, it is quite optimistic to see that only a small proportion of prospective students are saying that they will no longer study abroad, you know, kind of hovering at below 10% in the blue section. Instead, a far larger number of students at 50 to 65% say that they will defer or delay their studies as opposed to giving up on their plans altogether. In this survey, we can also see that a large proportion of students chose other and in the survey, we, actually, we also ask respondents to provide a bit more detail about this response, which we will see in the next slide. And in a few more slides ahead, we will also see how the pandemic's economic impact may have implications on student sentiments as well. So in terms of the other impact, um, it broadly includes three aspects. The first is a general sense of uncertainty, a wait and see approach to decision making or needing more information or guidance to make a decision. Secondly, a dependence on other criteria such as waiting on their parents to make a decision, um, currency exchange rates, depending on whether it becomes more favorable or not, and other factors that affect their ability to submit an application or receive an offer, such as language tests or obtaining transcripts from the schools during lockdowns. And finally, students are also looking at a range of other options including applying to a different university that has a later deadline or considering online study options. So moving on to the topic of online study options, understandably, there has been a sharp increase in the interest towards online learning as many universities switched to online delivery models during lockdowns around the world. And in our survey to date, about 40% of students indicated that they are slightly to extremely interested in studying for an online degree, and another 39% indicating that they are not interested at all. And the remainder said they, are, they would be somewhat interested. And to the question, we asked them, these prospective international students, would you be keen to begin your studies this academic year if um, you have to start online? To which 46% of the respondents said, yes, they would. The number of students who say yes increases to 54% if the online portion of their studies is shorter for a maximum of three months, and it drops to 33% if the online portion goes on for longer for a maximum of six months. While most students, as we can see in here, they are practical and understand the implications of the global pandemic on their study plans, where they're happy to accept starting their studies online, they are also rather cautious about online learning and how it may affect the overall education experience. So then we went further into the question of starting their studies online to see what students' expectations are with regards to fees. The general perception of almost 80% of the respondents is that the fees should be reduced. So quite a number of students said, said that they would expect fees to be reduced. However, when we asked them, you know, in terms of how much fee reduction is expected, students have very, rather different views of that. Slightly over half of the students surveyed say they expect discounts between 20 to 50%, while another 22% expected a larger discount of at least 50%. We also saw 14% of students expecting a discount of less than 20%. As the pandemic led to travel restrictions, lockdowns, and widespread economic impact in countries around the world, we can see how it directly affects international students' funding plans and affordability. And we can see in this question to our, to our international students on what information they would like to receive from universities, to which a large number of respondents said funding and scholarships. Other information that they would like to receive include information that will be helpful in choosing a de study destination or other pre-application information. But by far, the most sought after information is related to funding arrangements. So now I'm going to move on to, let's shift gears a little bit and take a quick look at responses that we've collected from institutions. 
In an earlier QS webinar, we shared several actions that higher education institutions have taken to steer through the crisis. For example, slightly more than half of the universities that we surveyed have shifted their curriculum online. Many have changed deadlines for applications or offer acceptances or deferred some 2020 offers to 2021. At this point in time, we are also seeing that some institutions are looking to relax language testing requirements with 15% of universities having already done so. Another interesting insight from the two surveys is whether students' communication expectations align with universities' communications. So this is interesting for a variety of reasons. As you may expect, during a time of crisis, there's an increase in students' expectations in terms of receiving relevant and timely information that is helpful to them. In QS Enrollment Solutions, where we manage communications with prospective students and offer holders on behalf of universities, we are seeing a, a very significant increase in volumes of inquiries from prospective students. In some cases, up to 100% increase from the previous year. In our survey, we asked universities how often are they in contact with international students with news and updates. We then analyzed to see if the university's communications were aligned with the students' expectations. In the top bar, you can see that 86% of students expect weekly or more frequent communications, even a few times a week. Universities are rising to the challenge. Many are providing updates several times a week, but we also see about 26% who aren't in contact with international students or are not sure what the frequency of contact is. And I think this alignment of communications can be, can be further looked at to ensure that students feel supported through this time. And uh, well, right on time, this is the end of the presentation and insights that I have got to share with you today. Um, but I do have some links here. We have a special COVID-19 web page with a link here that you can get from us after this session. You can find all of our COVID-19 related resources, which we update frequently, it includes a white paper on the insights that you have seen today and other taught leadership and resources. Uh, we also have a 2020 webinar series that we have been conducting on a range of issues and not just COVID-19. Um, and a couple more links here that I can share with you on this page. But if you have any questions, please feel free to get in touch through Phoebe and we'll be able to get you this information. Thank you. Thank you, Jingyi. And I think now we can move on to the panel discussion. All right. So should I just jump right in then? Okay. I'm very excited to be moderating this, what I would consider a rock star panel with the Vice Chancellor of University Malaya, where I studied a long time ago for my bachelor's degree, the CEO and Provost of Nottingham, Malaysia, where I also studied not so long ago for my postgraduate degree, and the president of, of the Asia E University, where who knows, I might be going for an online degree, right? So without further delay, let's dive right into the first question for Prof, Prof Graham. Yeah. And uh, you know, Prof, can you share a little bit about you know, how you think the COVID-19 crisis has impacted the higher education sector? Um, in Malaysia and how difficult was it for universities to transition to new ways of operating during the start of the crisis? Yeah, uh, thanks Ching and thanks for BMCC for organising this and welcome to everyone. Um, I feel slightly nervous because I can see about four of my colleagues from Nottingham on <laughs> as members, so uh, they're obviously interested in what I've got to say hopefully. Um, and I'll come back to Ching Lee later on to see if I'm actually a rock star or whether it was just for our first <laughs> guest. Um, but I think, I think the first thing I want to say is that the, the challenges that we had, um, and it, this, I think this is from the perspective, if you like, of the CEO. Um, there's lots of challenges throughout the institution, some of which I wouldn't have been aware of, was not as aware of. But I think the most significant challenge was um, the transition, transitioning to online almost overnight. Um, and the, the higher education sector have been talking about doing that for years, and we should have done it years ago. 
Um, but it was, it was always too difficult. I, I mean, some institutions obviously do it as their model, but it was always uh, too difficult or, you know, students wouldn't like it or uh, lots of reasons, but suddenly we had to do it. And I think the sector actually did that pretty well because we had to. Um, we had no choice in that, but that was a real challenge. And I know um, my colleagues who actually had to deliver online found some real challenges, but also um, had some good experiences with it. I think the other challenge we had was people working from home. Suddenly we weren't allowed on campus. I didn't go on campus for eight weeks um, only because I wasn't allowed on campus, but also because of interstate travel. I couldn't have traveled to campus anyway. So suddenly transitioning to working from home, I think, was a challenge. And then I think a challenge that we faced, which not every institution faced, but a large majority did, is we still had about 700 students on campus. Um, so we had to obviously look after them and they weren't allowed to leave campus. We had students across the road from us in other accommodation, private accommodation, who wanted to come back onto campus and they weren't allowed. So trying to um, manage and control and help and support those students was a real challenge with 700 students who were getting frustrated because they couldn't, we had to close all our social spaces, our library, etc. They're essentially locked in their room. So they're the three challenges we had online, working from home and students on campus from my perspective. I think, um, but I think the, the way it's transitioned in the higher education industry, I talked about it a little bit earlier, but if you look at things like Airbnb and Amazon and Uber and things like that, they, you know, change their industries um, significantly. And maybe this COVID-19 will significantly change the higher education in the sector going forward. And I think that's a good thing. And I think it needs that. And we shouldn't lose that opportunity. Going forward, what we, you know, we obviously want to take things away from this. I would like us to be more flexible in our online delivery. I think in the discussions I've had, we will never go to fully online. That's not the model that we want. Um, but we would like to have some opportunities to maybe deliver some of our material online um, and a lot of it face to face and some of it has to be face to face like laboratories and things like that um, and I'd also like to look at more flexible working I think most people I've spoken to have maybe not enjoyed working from home but found it quite liberating I think everyone who's worked from home actually has worked harder <laughs> I certainly have because you, you sit in front of your screen and you just work you know from the early hours in the morning till late at night but you do away with all of that travel and a lot of our, because we're out in Semini, a lot of our colleagues um, travel an hour, maybe each way every day. So they save two hours. So I'd like to look at more flexible working, but you know, that's, that's another challenge. But I think we couldn't have designed this experiment to see how it worked without COVID-19 and we suddenly had to do it. And we, while we were doing this, we collected lots of information. We did ask people to fill out timesheets. We did ask people to give me their reflections not to track them or trace them, but really to try and get some feedback. So post COVID-19, we could work out whether flexible working and working from home would be more applicable. So I'll stop there because I'm only meant to have three minutes and um, <laughs> if anyone's got any questions, happy to answer them later on. Okay, cool. Th thanks, Graham. And I think I would ask the same question to Dr. Rahim as well. Um, you know, how has the crisis impacted um, you know, the, the higher education sector and how difficult was it to transition during this time? And also taking a look at, you know, the, after the transition, what might be some of the practices that you will continue to adopt? Uh, thank you, uh, <coughs> Chigi. Um, for, for UM, this actually is um, something that we have actually done uh, something similar online since uh, 2016, where we had this so-called uh, one-week uh, online um, program, just, just to get everybody uh, on, on board in terms of what uh, online uh, uh, education is all about. And it came to, to bear last year when we had the haze for two weeks, when we actually went online fully for, for two weeks. That really tested uh, our learning management system, which we had, and uh, also uh, tested uh, especially the um, uh, faculty members uh, in terms of how to deliver online programs. Uh, fortunately, our, our system in terms of uh, hardware uh, we're able to cope with, with the, um, I guess, with, with the um, online system. Um, the, the issue for us is that uh, when we, we had this, uh, really, 
uh, in terms of uh, students' uh, connectivity, yeah, uh, and also in terms of the availability of devices. Eh? Because um, just like Grant, we, we have got two groups of people that uh, the 700 or so, somehow, somehow other numbers eh, sort of tell you nothing else, on campus, which have full access to, uh, to the, uh, in terms of connectivity, but we had the rest actually spread all over the country. Eh? So the issue of connectivity is, 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 is crucial and also the devices. But the other area is that for those uh, faculty members who have not actually participated uh, fully in, in our um, online week from 2016 on, onwards, had that uh, issue of yeah, how, how do we do this effectively. Is it? So, so we had all sorts of um, a variety of, of approaches as far as online is concerned. So experimentation was actually the, the, the norm during that, that particular period. But all in all, actually it went quite well in the sense that the students were actually um, uh, looking forward to it. Our attendance actually shot up, which is quite surprising. Uh, uh, and at the same time, we, we believe that it is, it's actually more personalized, yeah? where uh, faculty members had to work uh, extra hours uh, to, to, to handle various uh, queries, questions, and, and clarification and so on and so forth. Eh? So it actually also helped us in, in the same time to do the, uh, the blended learning. We wanted to, to push it further. And at that point in time, before we had this, it was actually 60%. And now we sort of uh, almost forced to go 100%, which is actually pretty good, yeah? But all in all, in terms of uh, the learning itself going forward, uh, definitely it needs to be a, a hybrid. We are all uh, social animals. Uh, there are certain areas which you can't do online yeah? in terms of how do you impart values, for example, how do you develop certain attributes which requires face-to-face uh, -face, uh, interaction. Yeah? Yeah? So this is something which uh, we, we believe uh, will, will, will happen, but we will retain the, uh, the, the online uh, advantages of, of, uh, of this, this, this so-called technology uh, platform that's available. That's something which uh, we need to, to, to address. And of course, uh, the uh, issue of uh, working from home is uh, again a new phenomenon for, I guess, a lot of uh, our, our staff. Uh, but in, in, in that context, I think most of us are actually back on, on, on campus uh, except for those uh, who are, uh, well, who, who he, the issue is, is in terms of uh, the cell protocol at, at work itself. If, if there's an uh, issue with uh, space, then they work from home, and also those uh, with, uh, with kids. But with school opening by July 22nd, we, we hope the, the rest will actually come on board uh, on, on, on campus. So, so all in all, going going forward, uh, we hope the I guess the ministry will, will stick to its plan that uh, online will be until end of this year. So that's uh, uh, then we can plan better, and uh, subsequently beyond that, we, we believe that uh, there are certain portions of, of online learning which we will keep, but we need also to have this so-called hybrid approach where we have face-to-face. Uh, learning and, 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 and teaching. Great, okay, thank you Dr. Rahim. I think it sounds really positive that um, the transition seems to have gone really well. Even You even had a drill for this since 2016 with the mm -hmm. haze and so on. That's amazing. Um, so now, si similarly, a question for um, Dr. Ansari is that since your university already had online offerings even prior to COVID-19, did you have to adapt any of the offering in order to, you know, further in order to meet the needs during this uh, time? Thank you, Ching Yi, for the, for the question as well as uh, Phoebe and the BMCC for organizing the, the webinar and inviting me to be a panelist here. Um, hello and good afternoon or good morning to all. Um, I'm glad to hear my colleagues, you know, uh, my brother, vice chancellor, <laughs> you know, from conventional universities had a good time with online. Uh, it's our DNA, DNA anyway, we've been in the business for the last 12 years, but to be honest with you, we only have about 10% of our students, our student body is fully online and 85% of them are on blended learning and 5% of them are on campus. So we have a mix mode that is, that is going through. We have a fairly, we have established a fairly robust ecosystem for this kind of uh, mixed mode 
of learning, we have a fairly comprehensive learning management system. And we have an extensive digital what call library, which can be all accessed globally because we have students coming from all over the world. It's all can be accessed globally. So what little things we had to do was to make sure that, you know, we enhance our learning management systems with a few more plugins. Uh, we wanted to make it more interactive and because the government allowed us to uh, uh, do more things online. So we put in more, more what you call uh, plugins uh, for that. We also introduced audio files, particularly for students who are in the rural areas and remote areas, we have quite a number, number of them. So, and they couldn't get any video files. So we introduced audio files for them. Also introduced some podcasts, podcasts for them. We increase our hyperlinks to resources so that you know students could study. They had more time to study anyway, being locked down. So we increase those resources for them to study. We increase, we changed all our what we call our assessments to online assessments as it fitted, but without compromising on the integrity on the rigor of the assessment systems uh, itself. We also conducted a couple of what they call uh, PhD virus online, and it went very well. Uh, it was uh, very well attended as well. And finally, we also increase our what they call learning analytics to make sure that you know we are monitoring the students' activity online, and you know they were they were being fairly active online and not being you know uh, lazy or you know dropping off, etc. And then this allowed them allowed us to monitor them and keep them uh, what they call engaged. That was a very important component. So that kept our our staff busy. In fact, all our staff was busy at home uh, monitoring the students uh, what they call uh, performance online. As for what they call uh, working. We have always had been working, working online to a certain extent and having work from home, we always gave that option of flexi working hours and therefore we extended it. And uh, lo and behold, uh, to our surprise, we found that more and more of our staff were opting to work from home. And that is going to be our new normal from future. We're getting about 25% of staff want to work from home now and just come in maybe once a week or maybe a couple of fortnights once, you know, kind of thing. That too is going on very well. As for what you call acquiring what you call new students, uh, we have always been using a combination of you know recruitment agents as well as doing what you call social media marketing, digital marketing kind of thing. So we shifted all to digital marketing and social media marketing. And uh, surprisingly, we found that there was more international interest in our programs. And so we had a, a huge watch of growth in uh, what international students registering for us online. So those are the things that, that, that happened very quickly for us. So there was some what you call, uh, uh, what you call a fine tuning that we need to do, but there was no emergency response to remote learning as to what you call my other colleagues uh, had to do. Thank you very much. I think I ran, ran out of time. Oh, yeah, don't worry about it. I think, I think that was very insightful. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ansari. I think I'll circle back to uh, Graham with the question on, you know, related to transition as well, kind of related to the point that Dr. Ansari made about transitioning to digital marketing to attract prospective students. So what changes did you also have to make, um, you know, directly, that indirectly affects student recruitment efforts in your team? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a live topic, obviously, and um, <clears throat> I suppose in the interest of full transparency, myself and Ching Yi work quite, fairly closely together with, because um, we use QS, their services they provide, and they're important to us in, in going forward in our marketing. Um, but I think we're not going to really know how effective our marketing has been until September, October, because that's when our major intake is. Um, obviously, we can't travel at the moment, so a lot of our marketing is done through recruitment fairs and through agents, but we have to go and visit them agents you know, and keep them, keep them happy. And we can't do that at the moment. So we have transitioned quite a lot, but I don't know what effect it will have. So we normally have an open day where everyone comes and we have to cancel that in March. So we transferred that to a virtual open day. We've had lots of virtual open days since then. Um, we've implemented a system where um, people can um, chat with our academic staff. And it was always a challenge, to be honest, to get academic staff to go to some of the recruitment fairs because it's a long, it's a long way to go to sit there and talk to students or potential students about topics that you know they might not be expert in. So actually being able to connect with people. So I think going forward, we will have more um, virtual marketing, um, uh, not only through agents, but through these online chats and virtual open days. Um, but I don't know the effect until September, October, because that's when, you know, our virtual open days apparently have been very successful, but I hear that a lot from the sector. But I don't know how many people are coming in, just kicking the tires and just having a look. How many register, or how many register an interest, how many then subscribe, how many get off of the place and then how many bums on seats. That's the important thing for us. 
And as we get more and more through this year, as we get closer to September, we'll know. Um, but at the moment, the transition to virtual marketing has proved successful, but that's only by the number of people that have attended um, and not actually registered yet. So, and if this works, then I think we'll do more of that. And we'll, we'll maybe look, look at dealing more with agents where in countries where we can't get to, maybe choose one or two recruitment fairs that we go to around the world. I think um, recruitment fairs in Malaysia, such as the Star Education Fair and the one that's at Mid Valley, you know, I think they're probably going to be looking at what they're going to do in the future because they might not have as, um, as big attendance that they used to have. I don't know. I mean, we might all flood back to Star Education Fair come January, but we may not. We'll see. I'm glad no one from the Star Education Fair is on here. But yeah, so it's, it's been pretty successful, but, you know, we won't know till September, October. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I think the numbers will be able to tell us if those uh, digital efforts have you know, yield the, the results that we want to see. Um, what about for Dato Rahim? Have you had to make changes to how you recruit students, particularly for international students? Uh, yeah, um, gee, yeah, I guess you are split into, into two categories. So again, the, as far as the local students are concerned, being a public university, going to a centralized uh, system. I, I, we don't think there's a, uh, there's a problem as far as enrollment is concerned in that particular area. Yeah? We've already been subscribed, oversubscribed as far as those uh, programs that we have. Obviously, uh, the impact will actually be for the international students. Yeah, again, the international students, there's two categories of uh, areas here. One is uh, students who come in on, on a full-blown uh, program where, again, issue of uh, online learning may not be uh, as attractive as face-to-face -face because I'm sure they are looking for additional, um, I guess, uh, advantages for being on, on campus versus just being on, on virtual uh, learning. Eh? So that's something which uh, needs to be, to be looked at. Uh, the other area that is affecting us perhaps is, is our mobility program because we have quite a, a large uh, mobility program, both uh, outbound as well as uh, inbound. But in particular, uh, inbound, uh, where previous years we have got about almost uh, 2,000 uh, students uh, on board every year, we even see some, some, sort of, some reductions here. Again, one can do a sort of a virtual mobility program and such, but again, it, it's not quite the same as being on, on campus because the experience that they want to, to have is it, really be able to, to feel and to experience um, um, what uh, uh, being in KL in, in Malaysia is, is all about. Eh? Yeah? So in that sense, we, we reckon even though we're going to have uh, the so-called virtual international day, uh, virtual mobility program, webinars and so on and so forth, uh, with uh, the, the, the pandemic and uh, with um, perhaps certain borders are, are closed, yeah, we, we reckon that there's going to be some, 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 some impact, uh, at least this year, uh, and hopefully for, for next year. And by the time, hopefully, the vaccine will be, uh, will, will be discovered, uh, then I wouldn't say things will be normal again, but uh, we'll see uh, perhaps a, a, a better uh, enrollment as far as foreign students are concerned. Uh, in terms of I guess postgraduates, uh, again, uh, they, are, they are back on campus. Uh, we reckon that portion will be least affected as, as compared to these uh, so-called undergraduate programs. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Dato. I think definitely all agreed with you over there. We are going to take a moment of the questions that I've got and try to answer one of the questions from our audience. Um, because the question is, do the Malaysian in education institutions have adequate online learning platforms to cope with increased demand for online education? So I think I could, uh, perhaps Dr. Ansari, would you like to take that question? Yeah. Thank you, uh, Ching Li. Um, actually, we had a program, a national, what you call a program initiative, started in 2011 and lasted till 2015 to get all the public universities, polytechnics, and community colleges to have certain elements of online. And therefore, when we did a ready e-learning, at that time we called it e-learning, e-learning readiness survey, we found that practically all universities, 
had some form of learning platform already in, uh, in existence in 2011 itself. So I think going e-learning or going online for Malaysian universities, public universities in particular, and also public institutions like polytechnics and, and community colleges was not something new that only is happening in 2020. It started actually about a decade ago. So I think most of them would have been prepared in some way or another. It depends on how extensive the platform was and how comprehensive the their platform, uh, platform was. But definitely, I think uh, it was not new because the, the what you call the task force that was engaged then, uh, we gave uh, what you call a roadmap for all these public institutions to have online learning going on in their campuses in anticipation that the future of learning will be more blended rather than totally face to face. So I think uh, with the pandemic, uh, you know, most of them were somehow rather prepared to address the pandemic and could take the, could make the change over to the online environment, learning and teaching quite quickly. Thank you. Okay. Um, would Dr. Rahim or Graham, would you like to share your thoughts? I, I, yeah, I, I could put some, some, some thoughts to it. Uh, I, I think one, one of the biggest challenges is actually is, is not so much as not in terms of system, I guess the question is whether they have got the comprehensive uh, learning management systems because when you go online, again, the, the issue of uh, assessment is, uh, is, is the topic which uh, uh, puts, uh, I, I guess, everyone on, on, on guard because whether you're going to have uh, final exams versus uh, summative uh, assessments and so on and so forth. I think that's one of the uh, bigger challenges for going online uh, fully. Uh, and, and this is something which is quite new, especially to the, uh, both to students as well as to, to academic staff. And I guess for, for us also, uh, when you go online, you need to somehow rather be flexible in terms of whether you go, uh, sometimes uh, because of connectivity and uh, students' uh, access, is that you have to go quite low tech, yeah? and at the same time, you need to go to be able also to go high tech. So that flexibility, uh, I guess not uh, many um, uh, faculty members are aware in terms of the, the range that one can actually do. So the issue for us is that the uh, faculty members needs to be a bit more flexible yeah, in terms of uh, uh, providing the, the, the intervention and at the same time uh, being able to deliver the, the, the right uh, content and the right quality of, of teaching plus also the assessment. So it is still, I guess, a lot of it is work in progress, but from the hardware side, system side, as I agree with the Dr. Ansari, I think we are actually quite well prepared as far as that's concerned, except for those uh, students that are perhaps uh, located remotely and also the conduciveness of uh, the students themselves uh, at their homes. Eh? Because if you get uh, students in the, in the B40 group, which uh, has got uh, limited spaces to, to work in and so on and so forth, uh, we have to think of other means. Yeah? They could actually uh, share with, with um, other nearby universities or even, for that matter, um, government, uh, I guess, uh, government offices so that uh, they, they can still uh, be, be, um, be able to assess the, the, the right connectivity to, to come on, on to the so-called online learning. Yeah, absolutely. So I think the challenge isn't just whether or not we have the right platforms or adequate platforms, but also the sort of internet infrastructure on a, on a broader mm -hmm. level for students to be able to access the content and the learning. So I think it's on one hand, we have the universities uh, subscribing to these platforms and putting all the learning on curriculum online. But then on the other hand, are the students able to access them? That's the, that's the point there. I think it's a very uh, lively debate going on in the, in the media as well in, in Malaysia. I have another, the next question from the floor. We have quite a number of questions from our lively audience. So the next one that I'm going to take here, um, I'm going to give this one to Graham. Do you think fees will likely be reduced in Malaysia, Graham? Yeah, so that question was asked by a colleague of mine. Um, I don't thank you for asking it back because it's obviously a live debate. <laughs> my, 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 take on it, my take on it is honestly, but I've got a very much a CEO hat on, is that our, our costs haven't gone down. If anything, our costs have gone up. Um, you know, we, we're still paying our staff. We've still got to meet our costs. So 
if we do reduce our fees or give waivers or give you know um, money back for the COVID period or whatever, um, it's going to impact somewhere else. And I understand the arguments of the students that they haven't been able to access all the campus facilities, they haven't been able to access libraries, sports centres and all stuff like that. I get that. I understand that. Um, but my, my costs haven't gone down. And the other thing I would say is that when you leave the University of Nottingham, when you leave any university, your employability is exactly the same. You, you come to university, you get a degree from the University of Nottingham and then you take that out and you wear it on your lapel and you show it to people and, and you get a job. So I, at the moment, it's, it is an ongoing discussion. We don't have any plans at the moment to reduce our fees or to, or to, give, um, or to give money back. Um, we may be instructed that we have to do that by the ministry, um, unlike I think the UK. Um, if the ministry says we have to do it, we have to do it. Um, and I know it's been in the press and people like Matt Koo and the VC Council have been involved. Um, and I think there's a feeling across the sector that we shouldn't reduce our fees or return money because our costs haven't gone down and COVID-19 is not, you know, not of our making. Having said that, we still have to provide the service, we still have to give the instruction, we still have to make sure that the quality of their degree is not, not affected, and we have to recognise that they didn't maybe have a, the full campus experience over the last three months. Um, but we, you know, I didn't have a campus experience, I wasn't on campus. So I, you know, from a student point of view, I can understand why they're asking. From a financial and a CEO point of view, it's a tough decision to make because it would, you know, create a huge hole in my budget. Okay, thank you for taking um, the, the question, Graham. Um, I have another one here from the, from the floor. Uh, so this is quite an interesting one, given that you know, integrating into the campus and orientating towards the next three to four years uh, in a new country or in a new city that they're studying in is a fairly important and memorable part of a student's journey. So how will the integration of new students, for example, um, the orientation activities be conducted for the upcoming intake? Um, I think this was an interesting one for Dr. Rahim. Yeah. I, 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 I think I can answer that. Um, well, we are, we are taking on board uh, the, uh, the foundation students coming in 1st of um, August, uh, it's about uh, 2,000 of them. Yeah. Um, to make sure that we, they, they get familiarized with, with, with the campus. Obviously, uh, with the uh, MCO is still, is still on, uh, the um, activities will be restricted, yeah? Uh, but we now have, uh, I guess, a, a leeway that uh, the government has issued out this less than 250 people, certain programs you can actually do it. So with, within that context, you could actually do quite, quite a bit, yeah? Uh, and by uh, October the 1st, we are also um, allowed to bring in the first year students, which will roughly uh, in, in the range of 4,000. So by October itself, we've got to be 6,000 on board, uh, on, on campus. So I guess as, as we move forward, the, uh, I guess the restrictions will actually be less and, and, and less. And I think from, from there on, we could actually uh, start to do, uh, I guess, a restricted, even a restricted orientation or restricted activities would actually help uh, students uh, be, um, be, be active and, and be participating as compared during the uh, real MCO, during that time where you're actually confined to your rooms and uh, to, to that particular building. So we, we don't see this as the, uh, so much of an issue. We just need to be a bit more creative or innovative in, in, in this particular area. Yeah, um, yes, thank you for that. I'm sure the staff are really trying to, you know, come up with all the creative ideas on how to transition, not just the learning and the curriculum, but also other activities such as integration. Uh, what about the University of uh, Nottingham, Graham? Do you, are you in a similar sort of situation as well? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're looking at, we're looking at this. Um, I, We've, we've spoken about it. We've not really started looking at it yet because at the moment we're, we're just going through our exams process. We've got our exam boards this week. So at the moment, our focus is in um, graduating our current set of students, our, you know, our final year students. But we have spoken about what we would do about orientation. 
Um, and it, if, if we're still no face-to-face -face learning, which is the current status until um, January 2021 at least, and that may change, but if that is the, stays in place, then our intake in September, October, will have to have some sort of online orientation. And we've spoken about online events and what we can do with that. But I think it will ultimately come down to the module conveners, to the heads of school, making sure that they connect with their um, their new students, making sure they put events on, whether live events, whether that's telling them about the university, whether it's telling them about their courses. Um, but also, all, I mean, we normally have an orientation, obviously live, which includes things like health and safety and our well-being and things like that. So I would encourage our well-being services and our exams and our registry to hold an online webinar for all new students. So I think it would be business as usual, but online, although that's, that's obviously not going to be exactly the same, far from it. Um, but it's not something that we've really focused on yet, because as I say, we're doing our exams at the moment or graduating, but it is something we will start looking at in the next couple of weeks. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. Um, I will now move on to uh, yet another question from our audience. And this one, I think, is for Ansari, really, about the online learning. So given that students are taking their classes online, how do you monitor students' productivity? So how do you know if they're paying attention while they're online? I think it might be quite different from a uh, lecturer looking at the students in a lecture hall. Yeah, the online pedagogy is very much different from the traditional pedagogy, uh, that's for sure. The, what you call the online platform itself allows us to actually monitor how much time the student is spending on each page, looking at each, what you call, um, each video, et cetera, kind of thing, whether they see the video to completion or not. Kind of, so it, it, it keeps track of how long they're spending the time online on each screen, kind of thing. In addition to that, we also have in our design of the, of the pedagogy itself, they have what you call pre-questions before they take the, the subject matter itself, and then they have post questions after taking the subject matter itself, all to be done online. So we can see whether they have, take, they have understood anything or not. Then we also have what we call chat rooms. And this is where the, what we call the online facilitator comes in and poses some questions, you know, some searching questions kind of thing to, and see how active they are in the in chat rooms. We also monitor the peer-to-peer, -peer, what they call interactions that takes place uh, within the chat rooms kind of thing. And over and above that, we also use WhatsApp. We also use all other forms of communications. Uh, phones, et cetera, kind of thing, to keep in, in track uh, with them. So getting all that, we can quantify actually how much time the student is spending make, uh, learning out each, each learning object and seeing whether it's successful or not. And then we come on board with the, with the online assessment to see whether they have studied what they're supposed to have they're studied. So it's a, it's a fairly different kind of pedagogy, keeping track of every little thing that they're doing online. So even if they're watching a video, we know how long they've been watching video, whether they watch for completion or not kind of thing. So that's how uh, it is done. And in terms of productivity, we actually look at uh, how our staff are productive in terms of what our facilitators are doing in terms of keeping track. So we keep track of them as well. So we just don't track what the students are doing online. We also track what the tutors are doing online. So we do that both ways. So it's a 360 degree uh, tracking as well as administrators, how they respond to questions and what is, what is happening, what are the problems with the students' problems are all, what they call being addressed, etc. Because what you also find that generally, I'm sure others also found the same thing, quantitative subjects are a bit more difficult to study online, uh, whereas you know, reading subjects are much, much easier. So that when it comes to quantity subjects, we spend a bit more time, what they call tracking how well they, are, they have studied and you know, putting out more quizzes, more questions to see, but these are not included in the summative, what they call uh, marks, they just keep track how much they're learning and how much they're understanding is in the, in the particular subject. Yeah, definitely, sounds very interesting, I think. Um, that's probably why uh, it's related to an earlier question about fees as, the, as in online learning. Actually, there's no shortage of investment that needs to go into ensuring that the pedagogy and the, and the quality of the education remains intact, right, right up to tracking and monitoring all these metrics that I'm sorry you were talking yeah, actually, about. Yeah, actually, it's very true because yeah. I think if, if, you, if you're looking at the new norm and the people are talking about blended learning or hybrid learning as a new norm, you got to make you know quite substantive investments into the into the what you call uh, into the system itself, mm. the whole ecosystem. Yeah. It's not just infrastructure, but also the software, the training of the of the staff, you know, uh, support staff as well as teaching staff, etc. Kind of thing. Training of the students itself, how to do things online, how to access materials online, how to you know uh, what you call uh, answer questions online, etc. Kind of thing. So it's a whole new ball game. It all costs money. And most yeah. of us in this business also spend hundreds of millions to setting up the ecosystem. So 
I, I, I sympathize with Graham, you know, uh, when the pressure is on to reduce fees, actually uh, your demand to spend uh, on infrastructure and training and all the other things that goes in, if you want to move towards the so-called new normal, is going to be more demanding on your, on your, on your bottom line. Yeah, absolutely. So I think just on the back of the same investment question, I have a question that maybe we can start with uh, Dr. Rahim. Like, in, in order to move towards more of these online or blended models, whether it's for students and, and staff, we you need to reconfigure the campus to move towards this model? And, and perhaps you might see less investments in space or buildings. Uh, of course, uh, with, with a legacy uh, infrastructure that we have, uh, Perhaps the, the, the large auditoriums and so on and so forth uh, has become sort of um, unutilized and uh, not in line with, with what, what we have today. So what we have actually on, on campus, we have actually started to have all these so-called flipped classroom uh, cubes, which are meant to cater for between 30 to 40 uh, students uh, in groups of uh, five, and, five or six. Uh, so that's actually on, on the as a, it's only been, been built, eh? been, uh, but it needs to somehow rather equip them with, with the necessary, um, uh, I guess, uh, panels and, 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 and so on and so forth. So that is, uh, again, the infrastructure that uh, one needs to somehow rather uh, change from uh, something which, is, which was done prior to, to, the, to this to something which is going to be for the, for the future. Eh? But uh, to, to, to pick on from uh, Dr. Ansari's point, when, when you look at all this in terms of the analytics that's available and so forth, to me, uh, it, it becomes a very personalized uh, learning. Then. You can actually track whether they like it or otherwise, you can actually determine up front whether the, the students' uh, interests are actually uh, in, in that particular subject or in that particular course itself. And uh, really, almost, uh, online tracking such that you, you monitor, just you don't actually monitor them at the end of the, of the program, but you monitor them on, uh, on a continuous basis, eh? yeah, it's on, online. Uh, and, and this is something which perhaps a, a normal classroom face-to-face uh, -face will not allow you, yeah? So that's the, the, the added, ad, advantage. But uh, infrastructure-wise, uh, again, uh, the, the, the question of um, if you have hybrid, you still require, I guess, uh, residential uh, colleges still to accommodate uh, students come on board. But that model then will change. Perhaps uh, if you go uh, on, on a rotation basis, you come as uh, when you are required and so on and so forth, requires a, a different model of, um, I guess, charges. Yeah? Uh, and it becomes a pay as you, as you stay versus uh, you pay for, for, the, for the whole semester. Then. So those those are the areas really needs to be to be looked at uh, such that uh, you, pro, you have to provide this flexibility. You are moving into this so-called new normal of uh, hybrid uh, uh, learning. Then, so you do you think uh, hybrid learning is just going to be the norm then? Yeah, I, I guess uh, you, you you have to you have to take the uh, the, the, the advantages of, of online learning. And uh, what uh, it, it actually provides uh, the uh, the students uh, uh, the so-called uh, personalized learning, student-centered learning, and you you also uh, trying to improve the so-called lifelong learning uh, aspect, where self-discovery is, is is one of them. You got to do some of the assignments on your own and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of intangible that comes with it, which actually develops the person perhaps better. But of course. We don't want them to be just uh, the so-called keyboard warrior and, and not have this so-called socialization interaction where it's important in terms of the development of the person. Eh? Yeah. Yeah? So you need to have, to, to, to have that. The question is, how do you plan it such that uh, at the end of the day, uh, you, you get this so-called holistic uh, person that comes out from, from, from the university? Eh? Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, what about Graham? What do you think about the need? Do you, do you think that this hybrid learning is going to be the norm and will you need to reconfigure campuses to move towards this sort of hybrid model? I think, I think everyone thinks that hybrid learning will be the norm and I, I'm one of those people. Um, the danger that we have, I think, is that we just run into once COVID is over, whenever that's going to be, or, or we learn how to deal with it. 
um, then we, we go back to the old normal and things just continue. And I think there's a good opportunity for universities across the world um, to transition into more hybrid learning, more blended learning. But I don't think it will just happen. The danger is we run into the new norm, uh, we go back to the old norm. On what are we going to configure? I mean, I think every university, when we build new buildings or reconfigure space, we always, we always talk about it being flexible. So we try and make it multi-purpose, multi-functional, small group learning and trans transitioning to large group learning. Um, but if I got a request now to build a new teaching centre lecture block, I would certainly um, question that quite hard. I wouldn't be doing that at the moment because... Um, you know, we might not need that going forward. So I think these these things, whether it's investment in buildings or LMSs or, or you know, um, different platforms, they're big capital expenditure projects and we don't rush into them. We look at them very closely. Um, but I would like to think we are going to transition to hybrid learning, but I don't think face-to-face -face is going to go away totally. Maybe small group teaching um, and a lot of the space we've got at Nottingham is, <clears throat> is flexible in that we can reconfigure it um, so in answer to I think it was Guy that asked that question in answer to Guy I don't I don't actually know at the moment um, but we're certainly not going to make any massive capex expenditure into buildings at the moment especially teaching buildings okay Singy could I just jump in there yeah I of course the, the research I think current research is beginning to show that you know despite the pandemic that the demand for face-to-face -face will always remain there. So it's not something that you're going to be exclusive. It's going to be online or face-to-face. -face. So I think the, move, the way to move forward and the natural way to move forward is that we all are, whether we like it or not, will adopt and adapt to technology. And education technology is, is there for us to utilize, to give a much more enriching learning and teaching experience to, to both parties, the, the what you call it, the instructors, as well as the instructees uh, kind of thing. So I think it is only natural but I think each university and each institution will have to determine their own roadmap on how they're going to go into what you call a blended learning. And as Dr. Rahim has mentioned just now, it is very personalized. So, that, you know, I think uh, the demand for the future clients will be more and more personalized learning. We also got to remember that we will probably have two cohorts of, of students. The fresh schools, what they call students are coming on board and they need a campus experience itself for them to develop their personality, etc. kind of thing. Then we've got the lifelong learners who actually are the workplace already and they need to continue, continue upskill and reskill themselves kind of thing also in terms of their knowledge getting the knowledge uh, up to mark. So I think this is where the what you call the, the balance between what you call using use of technology and face to face. I think this is something that every institution has got to ask and it's, it's going to be the new normal whether you like it or not. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Absolutely. Thank you for that comment. I'm sorry, that was very helpful. Um, okay, I'm going to switch back to some of the questions that I, I have for the panel. So, um, given that the COVID-19 is a fairly global um, you know, situation and crisis that has affected many students around the world, uh, and also as a reference point back to the survey data that I mentioned about how international students' decision-making has been affected by the crisis, uh, potentially changing the country that they had planned to study in and so on. But what, what do you guys think, you know, maybe starting with uh, uh, Dr. Rahim, what, what, how do you think that the COVID-19 crisis has affected the international student landscape in Malaysia? Perhaps the international I, 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 I mentioned earlier, I, 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 I think one of the issues is that uh, if you go, if, if the policy is to go online until the end of this year, Again, the, the attractiveness of uh, foreign students to come and enroll online may not be as attractive uh, a proposition as it is eh? because people want to come to your, to your country and perhaps experience uh, campus life and also the diversity and the variety of, of, of things that one can, can do apart just from, from learning itself. Obviously, uh, we are offering uh, quality education. That is uh, an attractiveness. But if you are just doing it online, Perhaps it's not as as as, as great. So that's why you see from your own survey, mm. people are actually deferring that particular decision. Eh? So maybe this year we may be actually hit by, by that sort of uh, enrollment per se. Eh? But there are also opportunities here because if, uh, for example, somebody wants to go to the US or even to the UK, even to to to, to Europe, they will be thinking not twice, thrice, four times. Eh? Because of the issues over there, uh, and at least for us, how we have handled pandemic, uh, I'm, I'm sure 
really give a, a, a good uh, thumbs up to the government for handling it so well. So that perhaps is, again, a proposition that uh, Malaysia can offer, say, look, uh, we have handled this extremely well. You can see the records in the report. Uh, and, and, and we take care of uh, our the protocols here are, are, are pretty good and people abide by whatever the, 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 uh, the protocol is being given out. So that's, that's a plus. So that's an opportunity there. But the other area is that one could, could look at is that with, with online learning, is that as, as mentioned by Ritu Ansari, you have now, you are opening your uh, market, not just uh, to um, uh, the locals, but it's to worldwide. Eh? Yeah, you can offer this uh, so-called micro-credentialing uh, approach, uh, upskilling, reskilling, uh, what you call uh, programs on board. So, so your enrollment could actually be more than what it was before, as compared to the traditional face-to-face. -face. So these are, the, I guess, these are opportunities which perhaps uh, will, will rebalance back uh, in terms of direct uh, foreign uh, students coming to, to campus, yeah? And it will not just be affecting those students, uh, full-time students, but also affect the mobility student, at least to me, uh, up to uh, perhaps the uh, end of this year, unless there are changes with, with, with the policies to say that, yes, uh, we're opening our borders now, borders are not closed, there are certain bubbles that uh, is, is being created. Uh, but again, if you limit that bubble, then you can only allow people from that, that group of uh, countries that will allow to come on board. See? Yeah? And that's going to be a, a bit uh, messy because you're not quite sure when those uh, borders are going to be open or the bubble is going to be created. See? Yeah, true, true. There's still a lot of uncertainty mm -hmm. um, in, in terms of the border closures, not just in Malaysia, but in the home countries where students could be coming from. But um, what about Ansari, given that most of your curriculum is online and you know, maybe 95% of your students access some level of curriculum, mostly online, right? So do you think that the international landscape changes for an online university like uh, Asia E University? Well, as Ching Yi has been positive, actually. Uh, I'm always a believer that every calamity actually gives open some opportunities as well. And uh, it's an op it was an opportunity for us, and we got more and more students internationally registering with us and inquiring about our programs, etc., kind of thing. But there's also an interesting phenomenon that's happening is that students will have to start their programs online with us and then later on come to our campus. So that too is being discussed at the same time. So I think uh, looking at it broadly, uh, you know, as uh, what has been discussed uh, earlier, I don't think uh, this is going to last a long time. Probably it's going to last about 12 months or so for the next 12 months or 18 months maximum uh, of, of what you call us creating bubbles for travel between, you know, Malaysia and other safe countries. But at the same time, from my colleagues, which I have throughout, uh, throughout Asia, what we're seeing is that the younger students are making decisions based on how each country is managing the pandemic. And, and therefore, as mentioned by Dr. Rahim, this is an opportunity for Malaysia, for example, to manage the pandemic quite well. And I know for, for, for sure that my partners in New Zealand are aggressively now marking, uh, marketing to get students instead of going to UK to, you know, to, to, to make a byline you know, to what they call to New Zealand and the same with Australia. So I think, uh, and I think uh, uh, what they call the branch campuses in Malaysia will also benefit because rather than they go to the host, what they call nation, they'll probably come here and get the same type of quality of uh, education. So I don't think it is uh, what they call a, a bleak story for as far as international students are concerned. I think it's a question of how each and every, every institution goes out there and sends the message out there that look, you know, there's still what they call a future for your, for, for your learning. And we are here to what they call to facilitate that learning in whatever way we come. Uh, we can, whether it's going to be immediately face to face or I'm going to give you something online first, but ultimately you'll be having that campus experience, you'll be having that living experience in Malaysia, etc. Kind of thing. So I think it is how the message that we put out uh, to get those students. Yeah. Yeah, I'm really glad to hear that it has been working out so positively for you that you have had more registrations than before as well. That's, that's very good. Congrats. Um, so on to Graham, same question, uh, you know, how has it affected the international students for you? Yeah, I think, I think it is too early to say because we're recruiting at the moment, we'll have to wait until September, October. <clears throat> um, but we, we have seen some promising signs and I know people like EMGS, they had uh, a big meeting yesterday, uh, a few days ago to 
link in with the public university, the private universities, the um, foreign branch campuses, etc. And I think they're tasked with, I, I think in the Malaysia plan, it's about 250,000 international students by 2025, which is ambitious, really ambitious, because they were trying to have 200,000 by 2020. And, you know, we as a sector fell short of that by quite a mark, actually. So to actually get 250,000 by 2025 is challenging when we're not even starting from the benchmark we should be now. Um, so I think if we're really going to attract, if we're going to make Malaysia an international hub, which it already is, but if we really want to pursue that, we've got to make sure as a country that um, organisate or entities such as the Ministry of Higher Education, KDN, EMGS, the Immigration, um, uh, you know, the Department of Immigration, all work together because at the moment sometimes we get sort of stuck between the, between one of those four. Um, and they don't really, it's not really synchronized. And other countries synchronize it much better and are really going after international students now because of, um, you know, the worries about where their students going to come from. And if you look at, say, the UK, the UK did this before COVID-19, but I think, I think, I might be wrong, but I think Australia have done this. Once you've graduated, you can work in that country for two or three years. And we had another BMCC event not so long ago, um, earlier this year, where we invited um, both public and private sector universities, both academic staff and students, and said, should, in our view, should students who graduate in Malaysia be able to work in Malaysia for two years? They can't at the moment, they have to leave the country. And the overwhelming support, the overwhelming view of that was that would be supported because it adds to the, you know, the knowledge base and the intellectual capital of the country. But at the moment, you can't do that. And students will be attracted to countries where they can actually get a job if they want to after they've graduated. So I think to meet, apart from all the marketing that we're doing, but to meet the 250,000 students by 2025, I think we need to be more coherent in the way that our stakeholders run, and that includes ourselves as the universities. Um, and we need to try and attract international students away from countries such as Canada, Australia, UK, etc. Because, you know, it is a really competitive landscape at the moment and getting even more so. Yeah, I think, I think on the back of the question, uh, along the lines of how the post-study work has done very well for UK institutions in being able to attract significant number of uh, in signif significant interest from international students, I have another question for the panel in relation to how can the Malaysian government, perhaps, you know, post-study work and, uh, you know, EMGS, as we had mentioned, is one of those, those areas. But what, what else can the Malaysian government do to assist to ensure that the higher education sector recovers from the effects of this COVID-19 crisis as quickly as possible? Um, Dr. Rahim, would you? Uh, I, I, I agree with, with, with uh, Grant in this, in this area. I think the, we need to reduce the so-called red tape, uh, the issue of the, again, visa application, the uh, work processes and so forth. needs to be a bit more uh, coordinated in, in, the, in, in the approach because that is the, the first thing that, uh, I guess, impact uh, the, the students themselves. They have to go through a, a round and around. Uh, it's something which, um, it's not 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 a very good experience uh, for 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 the uh, for the students, and of course, uh, being able to, to to work after you have graduated, especially more so the the uh, postgraduate students, where we actually have trained them for three years and so on and so forth, and we don't allow them. I think we, we were just losing that portion of uh, talent, which uh, unfortunately uh, they have used our facilities and so on and so forth. We're not allowing them to, to, to continue to back. I think it's something which uh, perhaps needs to, to, to reload. And, and how can this, uh, I guess, uh, students help us uh, with, with um, enhancing um, our e economy in, in that sense? Eh? Um, obviously, uh, the, the showcasing, as I mentioned earlier, of we handling the pandemic is actually a, a positive area where it needs to be pushed uh, 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 more so. Uh, sometimes, uh, Things which are positive, we are not uh, good in, in, in doing that. It's something which perhaps is uh, compared to, to, to others. This is uh, something uh, which is um, uh, of uh, value, I guess, especially to parents who want to make sure that uh, yeah, they send to their, their kids here 
they are quite rest assured that uh, yeah the 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 health side the the area of uh, all the health protocol is, is taken care of is is being handled quite 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 well see? Mm. and 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 also in in terms of um, how can we actually offer perhaps programs which other universities are offering if we have got this so called collaboration with other universities uh, we can actually offer them here uh, online from malaysia itself uh, which then depends on in terms of uh, how you partner with your uh, other universities in, in offering such programs before we tend to send people for i guess student exchange program for for a semester and so on the fourth and perhaps with with, with what is, has happened we can actually start offering that as part and parcel of our curriculum itself we just need to to work more with or work better with the uh, uh, with such universities eh? and and that's something which again is an opportunity perhaps uh, uh, it's not to say that the government has has a hand in it but i think uh, universities themselves has got this this opportunity to to work for it yeah so it's a collaborative effort with sectors uh, from the different stakeholders in the education sector as well as the government then what about ansari do you think that there's anything that the malaysian government can do to assist um, you know any thoughts on that but i agree with what my other two panelists have mentioned just now most of what they have said uh, but i want just to add a couple of couple other things i think at the moment now um, i think practically every vice chancellor and every university will say there's a bit of too much of micro management that goes on 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 how we are managing the, the universities itself and you know in the name of quality in the name of quality assurance etc kind of thing so i think there should be a lot more flexibility and leeway given to us the, the universities in order for us to be more competitive to be more innovative uh, out there and what graham mentioned just now in terms of you know working in concert i think that is something that is not not happening there is this still very what you call a look from the from the ministry about you know particularly the private operators you know whether they're operating well enough or not kind of thing that's that's one issue the second issue i think where we, the government can really really look at is encourage innovation i think they should actually loosen us and allow us to do a lot more because there's a lot more things that we can do but we're not allowed to do because of current what we call procedures rules and regulations for us to be competitive and for us to become a hub a real good hub and and, and get and get to target numbers that we are looking at so i think that is something else that we can we can do technology allows us to do a lot of things that we we couldn't do before and what dr rahim was mentioning just now we're talking about collaboration with other international universities you know having dual degrees joint degrees having micro credentialing from other other universities so and these are all something that can be done quite easily and quite uh, quite what they call uh, quite well by the universities but you know reduce the red tape and allow us to do those things uh, quite, quite easily the other the other part i think is looking at not just students who would like to come to to campus to get a degree but also for those who would like to upskill i think there's also that need for what they call universities to look at the working population because uh, i think we all agree that malaysia is you know is in the middle income trap and how do we get out of the middle income trap and this is where micro credentialing will play play an important role and all of us can can do that and what my other panelists have mentioned in terms of you know uh allowing them allowing the what they call the the highly knowledgeable what they call students which are, which are graduating out to actually work in malaysia and remain in malaysia as a foreign worker rather than getting low skilled foreign workers into this country so i hope this pandemic will make the government think about doing away with low skilled foreign labor and actually encouraging more of the what they call uh, highly knowledgeable you know skilled uh, skilled labor force for us to move up the value chain and become a much more what you call high income uh, economy so there are a lot of other things that need to be done in terms of the thinking that the government has got to do and how they are managing the entire the entire high education landscape including whether there are too many what you call institutions you know uh, after a very small market you know or whether there needs to be more incentives for mergers and acquisitions so that we get a critical mass and we get the what you call the right kind of landscape here and the diversity that's required in terms of higher education institutions not one size fits all but having a diverse types of higher education institutions that you know it fits every single population and let us be global in uh, in nature so i think i would say there's a lot that the government can do and i i do hope that they take this opportunity this pandemic opportunity to start looking at those things that we been discussed but has not been implemented okay Thank you for that. I'm sorry. And I think we we don't have much time left. I just wanted to jump into the uh, sort of wrap up 
part of this, uh, of this session. So ready or not, the crisis has pushed us uh, in this sector to adopt to new practices, whether it's digital marketing, remote working, or hybrid learning models and hybrid orientation and so on. And many universities have actually rise to the challenge and adapted and adopted to many of these practices. So I'd like to um, maybe let's end this webinar on a, on a more positive note from this crisis. Uh, let's go to the panelists and ask them, what do you see as a key positive development that could emerge from this crisis? Um, Graham, would you like to start with that? <laughs> no, but I will. Um, I don't know, I, I've been very impressed with the way that the, the sector, um, and obviously Nottingham's part of that, but the sector has reacted to the COVID-19 in that, um, you know, we suddenly transitioned to online overnight, um, and that was with everyone working from home. I think there's challenges around assessment. I, I didn't comment on, the, on, on that earlier on, but I think I heard a rumour that SA Mills have, you know, made a fortune out of... Um, over the COVID-19 because of the way the assessment's done. But I've actually, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not overly critical of the ministry and things like that, but, you know, I think myself and Datuk have sat on stages before and uh, I said, you know, you don't know what it's like in the private sector. And he said, you don't know what it's like in the public sector. You know, we have the same problems. Um, and I always think the public sector have an easy time and he probably thinks we have an easier time. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm critical sometimes of the bureaucracy, it drives me mad, but actually I think that has been a real um, advantage to us during this time. If you look at the UK, um, you know, it's been a bit, a bit strange the way they deal with it. I spoke to the UK, someone from the UK recently, um, it was about Leicester, if, if, if people are aware of that, Leicester being locked down again. And someone said, oh, is someone, you know, are they going to have police roadblocks? And someone said, oh, no, that's just logistically a nightmare in the UK. And I said, but that's exactly what Malaysia did. When they locked down, you couldn't go out or you could go out, but you got stopped by the police. You have to have a mask on, you have to have your passport, you have to have gloves, only one person in a car. You know, and that's reflected in the, in the relatively low numbers that we've had, both in cases and deaths in Malaysia. And I think the ministry all the ministries have been very supportive in this and been quite reactive. You know, they've acted very quickly, bearing in mind they've got 400, 443 private institutions and 10 public universities, and they've been very reactive and very supportive. And I think that shows that they can do that, and I hope that they continue to be, so they're always supportive, but they can actually act quickly than maybe they have been in the past. Because I think if Malaysia are going to be a world force in um, higher education, um, they've got to move even quicker. It's the Red Queen effect. Yeah, they can't just stay still because they'll fall behind. They've got to keep that. And they proved they can do that during COVID-19. So I take that as a real um, as a real high of what's happened with COVID-19. Thank you for that. Yeah, I think it is quite a scary time. And uh, personally, I feel quite relieved that uh, Malaysia has handled this, this health crisis quite well as well. Uh, what about Dr. Rahim? What do you think is a positive you know, development from this crisis? I guess when, when you look at overall, there's a lot of uh, positive that came up from this uh, particular um, I guess event or uh, pandemic. Uh, one is that the, the, the agility, the adaptiveness of the sector. I think when push comes to show, you really have to do something. When you push the wall, yeah, yeah, I mean, you react and you react positively, is it? So rather than negatively, you react positively. And uh, somehow or other, we are able to deliver still a, a, a quality uh, education. And um, hopefully some of this learning from here will take us uh, to the next step. Because if you look at the sector, the education sector, has been in this sort of um, uh, arrangement, uh, this so-called face-to-face for the last thousand years, and to change it, it requires something which is perhaps massive. And I, I think this one gives you an impetus to, to see, look, you have got other approaches, and, and we've been trying to sort of do blended learning, and it sort of almost takes you forever to do it. But this gives you the impetus to, to, to do something which perhaps uh, you've been wanting to do it all, uh, all along, see? Yeah? So, and, and it's not something that's bad, it's something which is good comes out of it, see? And the other one is, uh, again, it's an eye-opener for, for, for all of us in all sort of, not just education sector, but all sectors of uh, the country, yeah? in terms of looking at policy reforms that's perhaps necessary 
to relook at, at, at all this again. Hopefully, it just doesn't sort of let it fly back and it's back to normal again. Not, not quite, see? Yeah? I agree with Dr. Ansari you're saying that you have to look at overall what we actually learn from this and how do we make ourselves better out, out, of, out of all this. Yeah? So, and, and there are opportunities out of this. Yeah? Uh, and I agree with, with the concept that every calamity or every uh, sort of uh, negative event, there are always opportunities that come out of it. And we hope that we, we do not let it pass by and, and really pick it up and, and, and run with the ball. And, uh, and, and it's good for, for, for every, every, all the stakeholders involved. Eh? Yeah, cool. And uh, last but not least, Dr. Ansari, would you like to add your comments on what you think was a key positive development that could emerge from the crisis? So I would just like to echo what the others have already said that, you know, overall, I think the Malaysian government and the professionals in the front line did an excellent job for all of us. And we are all leading the, the, the rewards of that. And I think specifically for the Ministry of Higher Education, I must give a lot of praise to them because they did respond very fast. And they, they, they did do a number of surveys and got our feedback to it very quickly. And the good thing that came out of this, you know, it is possible for the government we always complain about our red tape or bureaucracy and they were able to make quick decisions uh, within this, this what you call period of lockdown kind of thing. And that's something that I think would have been a very good lesson that a government missionary can actually move a lot faster than what has been moving in the, in the past. And I hope that kind of pace is kept, uh, is, kept, uh, is, is kept, you know, and we all benefit from it. That's number one. Number two, as what is referred to earlier as well, it gives us, us, us as a nation an opportunity for us to look back and see what what we took for granted and what we like to see in the future. And uh, it's interesting to say that, you know, that uh, when you talk about essential, what you call items, education was not considered essential. It still is an open as, as yet kind of thing. But how can we make, uh, make ed education still continue despite whatever lockdown situation there, there, there will be, that's something as well. I think it allows us to be, to be a lot more creative than what, what we did before. Let us, let us keep this creativity, let us keep this on this innovation innovation path. Let us keep on this path of doing, making decisions quickly and making decisions collectively, involving all the stakeholders. I think these are the good things that, that came out and I hope that these are lessons that that is learned and lessons that we can continue to do as we move along. Perfect, thank you. So just a quick summary of the positive that we've seen is that, you know, Malaysia has handled this crisis very well. We're all very thankful to our frontliners and the prompt government response that has kept us all safe and, and healthy. And then um, to the comments of the panelists, I think we're all seeing uh, great silver lining and opportunities that's come out of it and, you know, the impetus to go online, uh, the fast and adaptive response from government and also uh, being able to transition very quickly for organizations like education institutions that's been, uh, you know, using the same model for, as you know, Dr. Rahim was saying, thousands of years, <laughs> right? So, yeah, thank you very much for, for this very exciting uh, session. And I'm going to have to hand this back to Phoebe because we have just run out of time, Phoebe. Thank you, Chingyi. Um, that brings us to the end of our webinar. Thank you very much to all our esteemed speakers and moderator for your time and for sharing your valuable expertise and for the very insightful discussion today. Thank you also to everyone who sent in your questions and for joining us today. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get to all the questions. So feel free to email me if you have further questions. Uh, thank you also to my colleagues, especially Ira, Aaron, Sam, and Karen, who have assisted me behind the scenes to make this happen. We hope you'll join us again for other webinars in the future. For more information and registration, please visit our BMCC website or contact one of our team members. Take care, stay safe and healthy. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.